Welcome to the Dirt on the Past, the Museum Edition, a YouTube and podcast program of the Extreme History Project, which explores ancient and historical topics relating to artifact collections from the Museum of the Rockies right here in Bozeman, Montana. At Extreme History, we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past because, let's face it, history isn't pretty, but it's so important to know because it's at the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney, and me, Crystal Alegria, as we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt, and in the archives, and in museum collections to uncover fascinating histories that are relevant to today's issues. And can help us move forward with a deeper understanding of the past. Hi everyone and welcome to the show. I'm Nancy and I'm Crystal and we're the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past and this week as usual we are at the EO Wigan Digital Learning Lab in the Museum of the Rockies and we're so excited today to bring you a show with a curator of history here, Michael Fox, and we are going to be talking about historic photos with him today. Welcome, Michael. Hey, thanks. We're glad to be here. We're glad you're here. You are here, Michael, and we're so excited to be talking about historic photographs today. Um, I work with historic photographs all the time, as do you, I'm sure, oh. Michael. And so um, we're going to just do a deep dive into these photos and, and see what we can see in them. So yeah, excited. Yeah, a nice collection that yeah. the museum has here. So, you know, historic photos, as Crystal said, a, an important part of the work a historian does. Um, archaeologists can use them, too a great way to learn more about the past, look at how things looked at different moments in time. They're really a primary source of information um, for how people lived, showing us um, how even sometimes they dressed, how they interacted with each other. Um, and it's just this very visceral representation that, that you know, we recognize, you know, we have so much of our lives are photographed today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so historic photos can answer a lot of questions we have. Um, and sometimes they can provide fodder for new questions. Um, we like to know when the photo was taken. We like to know who took the photo, um, maybe even what um, sort of camera they used to take it, uh, were they paid to take it, what was going on um, with all of that background for the photo. And those, especially if we have collections from um, a particular person, a photographer who maybe um, was prolific in what they photographed, either professionally or as an amateur. Um, so today we're going to look more closely at the historic photos in the Museum of the Rockies collection. And um, Michael, we'll start by asking you if you can give us just a little short history on how photographs came to be part of Museum of the Rockies collection and, and what are some of the examples of the collections that you have here? Sure. Uh, uh, our collection really started with the founding of the museum in 1957, and it was founded by uh, Dr. Carolyn McGill. And McGill herself was a great uh, collector of historic photos. She was a, a medical doctor in Butte, came to Butte in about 1916, 1915 and uh, immediately took on the role of historian. Uh, started collecting objects, collecting costume, collecting photos about uh, the history of Montana. And uh, in 1956, she was awarded a honorary doctorate from uh, Montana State College, which is now Montana State University, uh, in history. And as you know, part of that uh, kind of ceremony, the president of the university offered her the use of three Quonset heads on campus yeah. to house yeah. her collection. So our photo collection started uh, Gills collecting back in 1957. And over time, we've just built on top of that, built more and more. Um, almost 100% of the collection is from donations. Okay. Um, and when you, uh, you know, are dealing with historic photographs, um, as you were saying, Nancy, a lot of what you're looking for is who's the photographer, where was the photographer made, what's the subject, uh, you know, when was it made, that kind of stuff. With uh, photo collections, oftentimes we don't have those that information. We don't have all of those pieces. So, again, as historians, we might be looking at the piece itself to say, oh, well, this person is dressed in this way. 
this might tell us something about. Okay, that. so you kind of have to reverse engineer, figure out the time frame, the location, exactly. who it might be. Okay. And sometimes we have Close no idea. That means we get to just a dead end. We don't yeah. Know. Okay. So um, we have a huge collection here. It's guessing around 90,000 individual. Images. Oh my goodness. So many. So it's big. So I don't know how you can even catalog all of that. Yeah, That's it's an ongoing massive. Process. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we have a selection of those uh, on our website, which is, you know, museumoftherockies.org. And then you go to departments and you go to cultural history. And on that page, there's a link to uh, our photo archive. And it is set up by date, it's set up by photographer, it's set up by subject okay. matter, and by particular collections that we have. So we have a big collection by uh, Ben and Schlechten, two generations of uh, portrait photographers yeah, and wow. commercial photographers here. At Post. So it's, it, it's pretty extensive. And all of the images that we'll see today are online. Okay. So any, anybody That's can... Yeah, okay. and so that photo, that online photo collection is is super nice because you can search by all those different categories right. that you said, and you can see the different photographs. And then if if someone wants to order one of those photographs, they can just go ahead and order it from that website. So it's really nice. It's in and you can. Even if you don't want to order them, I suggest people just go on and browse around because the photos are so amazing and they give a real overview of um, historic life in the West. Absolutely. Sure. And because they come from such a weird, such a large, not weird, but a large variety of sources, there are always surprises. Yeah. There are things that, you know, you might have one photographer who's taking a bunch of photos of one thing, and then there'll be one thing of something else that's totally completely. And oh. I'll show you an example. Okay. okay, fantastic. First of all, I want to look at cameras. And we've got Yay. a Yay. large, large collection of cameras. So first, I've got a quiz for you. Okay. Two, what are called view cameras. Yes. To, to take that, to see what the photo is going to be, you have to look at the back of the camera. Um, generally, there's a piece of ground glass on the back. So you use that to focus okay. uh, and to frame whatever you're taking the photo of. So these are two pretty similar looking cameras. Uh -huh. uh, this one doesn't have the lens, but I brought it out for a particular reason. Okay. Um, so I was just asking you, which one do you think is older? Oh, what do you think, Nancy? I feel like the one that my husband has looks more like that one. So I'm going to say this one's older. Okay. And I'm going to say that one just to be opposite, just for the heck of it. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, I brought Are we this both up. right? Yeah. <laughs> Do we get a okay. Um, this one looks older because of the condition of it. It's in uh, really yeah. bad condition. It's really old and beat up. But that one no, is actually right. considerably older. Um, considerably older. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I think this was probably made between 1868 and 1870. Wow. Yeah. That is wow. Old. Um, and in fact, it's so old that the camera itself is not marked in the barrier really? release. they didn't even bother wow. to put their names on it wow. it's all handmade um wow. it is beautiful probably is beautiful. made in london and the way we are inferring that is the lens uh is by a guy named dullmeyer out of out of london and this particular lens was only made between 1863 and 1865. oh, oh my goodness that's, that's nice. fascinating yeah, so, that's uh, a nice just would have mounted on a tripod you right? would have put this on a tripod okay. that that's exactly right and I want to bring out these two types because this is a what we call a wet plate camera. And this is a dry oh. plate camera. Ooh, the wet plate ones. So the what is the age of this one? This um, is about from 1938. Okay, well, so that's way much, older. You are yeah, really much, right. Yeah, so that's much, much older. <laughs> yeah, well, so. I know Ian likes to use his, he's brought out his camera like that, put on a tripod, and you have the whole blanket that oh, goes over yeah. you and, and it, right. it is a magnet for people when we've been in south africa when he's been in yellowstone park whenever he brings it out people are drawn to it and he's often looking for models and trying to do because it's great for portraiture and things and it is this big deal yeah. to use it i'm sure it's still easier than the sweat plate one but it's uh, it produces phenomenal quality images that you can blow up really big there's there's so much so many pixels in there or what, whatever you would have called them then so yeah um so go ahead michael i'm super, oh, no, super no, no. excited they, yeah. Uh, yeah and uh you know, what what you're talking about are really large format photography and that's exactly what these are this isn't like your little 35 right image 
these are big images that are extremely clear, exactly as you're mm -hmm. saying. And I've got a couple of examples okay. of what those look like. So the okay. one your husband is probably producing is probably a larger version of this. This is a yes, these negatives. Wow. Oops. Paper over there. Oh, okay. No, it's not. It's not. It's not clear. It's on double sided. Oh. So. It looks a lot like this. Yeah. There okay. we go. See that? Oh wow! Oh, that a harvester right there. Yeah. So this okay. image is from about 1903, but it's made on celluloid film. Uh, which means it's not like the scary nitrate film, which can spontaneously combust. Oh, good. But uh, <laughs> from I would say from the uh, early 1890s onward, this was really kind of the standard uh, okay. that you would use in your large format camera. Right. Wow. Now, previous to this, they were using glass plates. Okay. So this is like a negative film, like we. It's exactly a negative like, film. And it's you know, just one is in there at a time. Yep. And okay. then you have to change it each you pull time. The magazine out. It looks like this. Double-sided magazine, so you have one sheet of film, or in this case, one sheet of glass on okay. each side. Isn't that beautiful? And so you can get two in there, but you have to turn it over or whatever. It's it it's an ordeal, I know. So what happens when you're wearing a big hood over your head? That's when you're looking through the ground glass. To get right. The, get the focus perfect, get the framing perfect. Then you take your that off. You already have the film loaded in here, and you stick that in and pull one of these out to expose the film. So um, pretty complicated. Wet plate yeah. process, every element of it has to be done in the dark. So you have to you have a piece of glass. You have to take the chemicals, uh, including the silvering, and apply it. It has to dry to a certain extent, but not too much. Oh, boy. Uh, and then you have to put it in the film holder take it outside, put it in the camera, expose it, and then immediately develop it. Oh, my goodness. So all of those, you know, everything before you put it There's in the There's so many ways after, that it can go wrong. Can go wrong. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then once you're done, you've got this. Okay, and so this is plate. more of a glass plate image. Which it is, and... is also more delicate. It yeah. can break. Yes, yeah, look at it that. is. So if, even if you're a super professional photographer, if you drop your box of yeah. negatives, they're all destroyed. Oh, so um, yeah, this is again made on a camera. Either of these could make that, but more likely it's something more. Okay. 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 So yeah. Um, yeah, those are really the types of images we're going to be looking at today. Fantastic. Or actually images made from these types from of From these types okay. of, wow, okay. that's interesting. So, um, so this podcast is going to be very... Um, we're going to highlight a lot of things visually, but we, we, the three of us should also talk through what we're looking at so that people who are just listening can follow along with us too. But if you want to see what we're talking about, you can always go to the Extreme History Project YouTube page and click on and watch the YouTube version of this as well for those who are just listening to this as a podcast. So I wanted to great good say that, for too. that. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. So so let's so let's look at the next thing, Michael, and look at some of the photographs. Is sure. that what we're going to look at That's now? That's what we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. So um, yeah, we're you know we've been discussing a little bit about how historians uh, utilize photographs, and you know what we're always looking for when we're looking at material culture. That's I. That's objects as opposed to something that we read in a book. We're looking for the uh, details that are that that we can pull out of this. What does this tell us about? So this is the Jacob Van Grundy Saloon in Deer Lodge in about 1890. Okay. And there's a lot going on here. There is. You can see we got a dog <laughs> up on the on the roof there. I, I don't see the dog. Um, the, dog the dog is on the right second the story on the balcony. Oh right my in gosh. the middle. Oh, I see I him. Know. I see him. <laughs> You've got a saloon. You've got the saloon keeper. You can tell it by the uh, big white apron. Okay. Uh, a okay. lot of patrons out there. And you see a striped pole. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, that means right it's there. a barber shop. Okay. Okay. So um, the barber shop right next to the saloon. There's huh? a barber shop right yeah. next to the saloon. Very typical. During this period, you might have a barber shop in the actual saloon. Oh, interesting. So, huh? um, okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's where we're starting here. And um, yeah. Uh, M.H. Rice, he is a photographer in Deer Lodge. Again, um, 
about 1890 or so. Okay, so 1890 was that one. Right. And that was an outside um, photograph, but this one is an inside this that we're looking inside at. Inside photograph. Yeah. And this is in a bar Interior of a saloon. So bar stools yeah. weren't a thing um, back <laughs> then, right? You just stood up at the bar, you bellied up to the bar, and that you have a place to put your feet up that, that is rail. exactly right. And okay. um, yeah, you would you do. That's where the term belly up to the bar mm. comes from. You put wow. your foot on that, uh, on that railing there. Yeah, there's a railing right along the bottom of the bar the bar itself and yeah and generally when, you would see a bunch of spittoons on the yeah. floor here and you can see there's one right behind that guy oh yeah That's i see it i right. see it yeah very messy very uh, messy so, very, yeah, a very messy like floor standing up <laughs> spitting on but that. beautiful wooden bar oh, it it's looks gorgeous. like it would have been you know brass or some sort of metal was where you rest your feet up on and then a big beautiful mirror and this cabinetry holding liquor or glasses and things like that and a tin roof it's it's really you know oh and there's actual saloon doors yeah yeah so um ashley just said that it looks similar to a virginia city bar yes and so true. so they do all kind of have a very similar look that's for sure but i love nancy the saloon doors that you yeah. you know that you, you see Swinging in all the westerns when you, you know yep. you, they walk in very and dramatic. swing the door exactly. open yeah i yes. love that and that tin roof is beautiful and i've you said michael this one's from bozeman and i've tried to figure out exactly where this is and haven't been successful yet but it is a beautiful tin roof and a beautiful bar there's other things going on here as well okay um, you notice the bob the mounted bobcat oh right yeah there's yeah, yes. several uh Heads here. You got a couple okay. of heads. There's an antelope there. Yes. Yeah. And, and a little bit about the bars. These are generally made out of pure mahogany. Really? Oh, so wow. that rail is in fact brass. That's mahogany. And all of this material, none of this is made in anywhere near Montana. No. So where are they getting that? This from? is coming from like Cincinnati. It's coming from New York. So all of this had to come on the train here. Okay. And you're right, Ashley. This does have the same kind of look as uh, a bar might have in Virginia City in the 1870s, but uh, this is a lot higher class than that. And mm -hmm. if you can imagine, it, then they did have pretty elaborate bars like this as early as the 1870s in Virginia City. But can you imagine all of these pieces being transported via wagon? No. I mean, these giant what? mirrors. Oh, I know. Yeah. I can't imagine how they get the mirrors. Right. I mean, that's massive. Looks like two pieces and they're both huge. Yeah. And um, yeah, generally a lot of the same companies who built these back bars built pool tables as well. Oh, so okay. okay. And so what year do you think this is, Michael? This what? is about 1915. Okay, 1915. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the bar looks beautiful. The crowd looks a little rough, though. Yeah, they do. I was just thinking these are, that. <laughs> these are working I, I was just going to say kind of working class gentlemen. And it looks like broad daylight outside, yeah. too, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Like they're drinking in the middle of the day. <laughs> they're day drinking. That's what they're doing. They're <laughs> no okay, shame so. in that. So that's compared to this. And this is the exchange in, uh, in Helena. OK. But you can see here, you can definitely see the spittoons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But. Um, you know, you've got a lot of similarities. You've got the nice wallpaper. There's, a, I believe this is a tin roof as well. But um, yeah, yeah, we know was... this one is from uh, just about the same time as, as the other one. But okay. this one, um, yeah, again, really pretty similar step. But uh, it appears to be a nicer class. It, it does. definitely it does. does look like These a higher class. Men bar. are more well dressed, yeah. and their hats look clean. They all have the same mustache. They do. Must have been in fashion. <laughs> it's big, right that big. Then. I don't know. Do you call that a handlebar mustache? That's a handlebar yeah. For sure. Yeah. There's a few. There's three. At least three handlebar mustaches that I see there. Right. So, and I love the big cash register behind the bar, right in the wind or in the mirror. That's right. and so there's beautiful. no tables anywhere in either of these yeah. photos so they're not serving food or anything generally uh, it depends on the place if you go to the next slide oh, oh look at that totally you'll see a very yeah. different look here and you could you can't even see the bar here but this would be to oh i the, love that uh, yeah over to the uh, the far left side so this is against that the side of the bar that is uh you know away from Right, the actual, actual bar. bar itself. Okay. And um, yes, they uh, they did have tables. Okay. Oftentimes, that those photos didn't uh, didn't really show that, but there are a lot of bars 
that are nothing but a bar and that's it. There's no tables. That's there's it. No you just stood around with your drink that's and then you get out of there when you you're done. Okay. <laughs> or you lay down and sleep. These guys are playing. It looks like they're gambling on something. They are playing yeah. Pharaoh here. Pharaoh. Interestingly, okay. this is not even Montana. This oh. is in uh, Tombstone, Arizona. Oh, this wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 And is, we have this in our collections? This is in our collection. And there are a few things I drew in here that aren't really from our collection just to compare. Oh, but sure. Very, very okay. few. Okay. But for looking at the saloon culture yeah this is a really different view than those other ones yeah you can look at who these guys are you can see the guy right behind the table against the wall that's the dealer oh. and pharaoh is a notoriously excellent game for the house and notoriously terrible oh right interesting okay. the uh oriental is important too this is the saloon that uh white herb mm. in, mm. in the mm. same in the same building but you can see um, it's around 1900, so everybody's wearing derby hats, except for the guy with the, the silk Really, really is nice. Um, he's got a, uh, a lamp over his head. That's a gas lamp. Looks like so, they all have newspapers, too. Are, guys or, newspapers or a few too. of them, and yeah. This, uh, are those newspapers, or are those... Those are newspapers. Okay. And those would have, that newspaper would have been the Tombstone Epitaph. Okay. So, um, yeah, very different view. Yeah, but, I love uh, that. They're all so, so interested in that game. And look how there's jackets and hats hung up on the wall. I don't know if there were specific nails or if there were just some things to get, but they're kind of haphazard. But then there's that one guy in the back you can see. He's got his hat on, but not his jacket. Yeah. Right. I guess playing Pharaoh, you can get a little sweaty maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah, but a lot of different, it looks like a kind of a mixed um, group of like working men with maybe you know some businessmen thrown in there as well a little bit of a different mix there to me looks like but I love the lights above the the game so you can really see that this is um, well, a well-lit bar yes definitely yeah. so I compare that to this mm. oh wow this is at uh, Karst Camp in Gallatin Canyon probably in the 1940s okay much oh. later you can see how uh, bar uh, style has changed yes. as well as the style of these uh, well-fitted out dudes from definitely from oh the my. Dude, dude ran. This looks much more rustic. Right. Yeah. And it's all made to look that way. It's like the idea is to make it look like a bar that's actually even older than the ones that we have looked at from wow. the okay. 1900s. Like so, a yeah, pioneer it's, bar. It's a pioneer um, but they're all sitting on stools now. And all again, they look stools. more rough hewn, like they were handmade or something. And it, I figure it's just fitting in with that whole style. And there's Absolutely. women in this And photograph. there's a lot of women. <laughs> Wait, and no, no women in any of the other photographs. Right. In, in right. Those bars, because which... of things like the spittoons and the uh, excesses of customers, which sometimes uh, included vomiting and spilled beer and liquor, it was unheard of for women to go into a saloon mm -hmm. at all mm -hmm. until probably the 1920s. Yeah. So women, yeah, you did as a woman, you didn't go in. If, if a woman did go in, everything would stop. Everything would just wow. stop. Everyone wow. would stare. It's just too rough. Wow. too rough. By this time, okay. those days are over. So yeah. yeah. But we, I think we're looking at these uh, in a very uh, historian type way we're like looking at how are these different so and instead of having a, a head mounted look they have a, a painting of yeah, an elk okay. up there an elk. i'm sure they have some heads somewhere in there that yeah, we can't they see, must. But yeah they must but yeah. a lot look of native at the, american tapestry yeah, yeah. Yes. Say the native american right. they're all yes. wearing hats these cowboy yeah. hats kind of these you know? are big fancy dude hats yeah, so yeah, cowboys dude generally aren't okay wear those, okay yeah. So, the dudes yeah. are all wearing a hat. <laughs> and do you think the gentleman on the right who has those fancy chaps, the, uh -huh. the, the chaps is um, a dude, or do you think that's actually a cowboy? It could be. And I did one. cowboy with air quotes. It could be either <laughs> one. If this is a cowboy, he's definitely working in a dude ranch. Yeah. For mm, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. A working cowboy is definitely. No, because that cowboy. doesn't, and they're sparkling clean. They look like they're white and they don't yeah. have like a piece of speck and, of dirt on them. And look at the woman has. Some, Oh. Chaps too. Yeah. So, um, but this, but yeah, when dudes came out to these dude ranches, they would buy all new clothes to go to be so they oh, hang out. Words. They're living the dude yeah. life. Okay. So the lady there in the foreground there, you can see she's got a pair of beaded gauntlets. Oh, okay. So, Is that what's on her lap? Yep. Okay. They are all getting into. Wow, that's that's a great photo. I love that, and that's Karst 
um, campus is not is in the it's in Gallatin Valley. Gallatin and Valley. It is right. there. It just, it's not called Karst anymore, but the remnants of it are still there. If you go to the next slide, you can see it. Okay. Oh, wow. It started out as Cold uh, Karst Cold String Cold Stream uh, Resort. This is about 1915, I would say. You can tell that by the acetylene lamps on the car. Oh. Um, but uh, Car started out as a stage station mm. before automobiles or anything were here. And once uh, it became more accessible by vehicles, they turned into a dude ranch okay. as well. So okay. it became a gas station. Um, and uh, yeah, really kind of that you can see the components of that still. The, that uh, building that was the bar room, that is still up there. I don't think it's still a bar room. And these all look like, um, you know, log cabins made to have that whole feel yes. of coming out west the to, ranch, you know, yeah. yeah. That's right. So the next one is another shot of this. And this is, uh, these are the karsts. Oh. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is them at the uh, actual, the place. It's Pete and Jenny Karst. Um, again, this is probably around 1915 to 1920. But again, okay. you could see it's meant to look super rusty. Yeah, they look super rusty. They do, that, but, it's new. <laughs> but they're working. They're, <laughs> they're, they're working. They're not the as ranch. fancy yeah. though, yeah. right? As the people, I almost wondered yeah. if it was performers in the bar because they all look. But if you're saying they're guests that bought clothes, because these guys look like they're really doing the work out there. Yeah. They're not. There's nothing duty about yeah. them. That's know? right. And if you again, you got to think about the yeah. date. This is probably 1920. Dude ranching in this area was just getting going. Interesting. Okay. So these guys are more like. We run the stage stop. Right. Okay. But you know, and this is way out in the middle of nowhere at this point in time. I mean, it still is really. It really kind of is. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they were working out there, living out there. It was probably a pretty rough existence. Indeed, it was. And they started out as homesteaders. And okay. the next slide, you'll mm -hmm. see this is the Crail Ranch, okay. um, which is now the center of Big Sky, Montana. Okay. So really? this is the Crail okay. Homestead. This building is still there. Oh, wow. Um, if you go there. And um, yeah, this started out as a homestead. And uh, they started out in about 1902. And um, eventually this was sold. This is the place that Chet Hudley bought in 1973 okay. to start Big Sky. And Big Sky is a big ski resort now, huge, um, huge ski huge. resort, and so one of the biggest in the world or in the U.S. It yeah, is. yeah, it's yeah. massive. Yeah, yeah. and so it's um, this is kind of the beginnings of it here, I guess. And I love the, I love the um, kind of the things that are on the ground outside the cabin. They're the the gentleman boots or you know cowboy boots his mucky boots, his yeah. mucky boots with his hat and, on top yeah with his hat on top and some other things kind of strewn around it looks like maybe a jug of something, something. <laughs> a can and uh, uh, yeah. yeah for sure and then the next one is their next door neighbors oh nice and this oh, is wow, look um, at that. probably a little bit later these are the Mitchners. okay and um also in Big Sky. Yeah, then. they are okay. also pretty, they're right next to Big Sky too. But they got their dogs out there. Yeah, and, and these these yeah, look like it's... these look like the people in them built the houses themselves. Yeah. That's what kind of houses yeah, are. they're very are the modest. And, yeah, they're building their own structure. There's a this one at least has a little bit of a porch that's covered. The other one yeah. doesn't have that. This this looks more like a you know just a not as much of a log cabin look but more of just a built wood frame house look so it's a mm. little bit different but you can kind of see the log cabin look behind this one and it's not unlikely that that log cabin yeah. was built first and, and then, then they, they built, built this frame one. building later yeah and all the kids are out there so um in height order in height except order. for the and one the that's little, being held the little one <laughs> yeah and then two dogs and yeah, yeah, yeah. so you can see there are generations of mitchners and they're still mitchners in living really oh, okay right. wow and the next one continuing on our gallatin canyon look this is up at the uh nine quarter circle dude ranch and this was uh, again when there was established as a homestead that became a new ranch and um, yeah, so this is around, uh, again, around 1920, right when Dude Ranch is getting started. So they've got a big uh, herd of horses here. Um, would they do, the so the dudes would ride the horses, they would kind of go on um, 
horseback rides, just like they kind of do today at our ranch or at Chico or somewhere like that. That is exactly right. Okay. And they, um, yeah, they would take them or they could take them out on, uh, that it kills you. They could uh, organize hunting trips. Mm, you okay. could go out overnight on a trail ride, oh, sure. something like that. Mm -hmm. Or you could go out on the trail ride, and they would bring the check wagon out. Okay, for oh, dinner. that so sounds very like similar fun. Yeah. to what you do today. Yeah, okay. these yeah. were the innovators. Okay. So they're the ones who, we basically invented new ranching in the area right around Yellowstone. And, really? Uh, Yelta Canyon. Wow. Is, is that true, Michael? Wow. That is absolutely true. Know that. Wow. wow, that's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. I, I feel like how they get to be this old and live here I know. this long <laughs> the, and not know that. The first dude ranch was the OTO ranch, which is just really? uh, north of Gardner. Oh, wow. Okay. That's okay. amazing. So now we know who to blame. Yeah. Right. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, I got another quick one of just their horse herd. But you can see it's gorgeous. Oh, it's so wow. pretty. And you know, if you yeah. go, if you make that drive today up the Gallatin Canyon, it looks just like this. It's still very much this landscape is still very intact and it's beautiful up there. And, and, you know, I can just see it as I'm looking at these photographs. Horses look very Right. Happy. And this yeah. is a little bit further up the Gallatin Canyon than Big Sky, but these guys are all neighbors. And that's okay. the thing that I don't think we, we kind of don't really understand that well now. Right. It's just because they're all uh, Does it doesn't mean... mean they're not a community. Right. They all know each other. Right. You know, they know what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. Depend on Same. each other, I'm sure. They yeah. absolutely depend on each other. You yeah. know what the winners are like. Yeah, oh, I, know. I can't even imagine yeah. living. That's right. why when I, you know, I saw that for the the Karst family and her dress, I'm like, oh, I feel for you. <laughs> like, I, know. I can't imagine I know. living up there Ooh. through a winter. Right. But um, yeah, Galton Canyon was also really popular uh, just for people like from Bozeman to come up and you know, come up for the day. Okay, much yeah. like, much like it is today. So if yeah, the mm -hmm. slide, we, we, we still do that. That this bridge is Whoa. sitting on top of House Rock. Oh, oh wow! Oh my gosh! So, um, and yeah, this is where people would be kayaking or taking rafting trips exactly through today, today, right? Yeah. Right. So uh, yeah, it's the same idea. Um, this is taken in 1905. I so wouldn't walk on that bridge. Coming, <laughs> they've been coming up here for a long time. <laughs> look yeah. at that. Look so at that's looking. 1905, and that's the Gallatin River. Wow. Right. And, and House Rock is, is something that, you know, people just drive to see today. And uh, when the, the, bridge, the bridge is no so longer there. It's super yeah. dangerous because yeah. it's mostly covered, but they the rafters all know it's there. Wow, that is crazy. No, the no, bridge, no, no. Is, bridge gone. is gone. Yeah, long mm. gone. And so, but you can, there is a pull out on the highway. So you can pull out and you can stop and you can watch the kayakers and the rafters go by House Rock. And it's very, at certain times of the year, it's scary for those people because it's really moving. The, the river is really moving. And if you don't know there. where it is, it yeah. could be an issue. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's definitely. Got some good rapids going. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's this was really the, neat to see. So Galton, uh, Galton Canyon was always like kind of a recreational spot. Yeah. You go to the next one. See some campers out here going okay. fishing. This is 1901. Wow. And this is at Hell Roaring Creek. And you know where there's a that's where there's a big bridge right there. Okay. Right we're right still in. in the canyon, still in that yeah, galaxy. We're still canyon. in the canyon yep. here. I love so let's just talk for a minute about these outfits. I was gonna say they are all <laughs> very classic. well dressed. This very well dressed. I mean the women, the women are you know dressed to a T. They have their their Victorian jackets and skirts and those hats. They have some amazing hats that are just huge and beautiful, covered with flowers and different things, ribbons, ribbons and, and bows yeah. and, and all sorts of things. I love that woman's cape on the left. And, yeah, you know, I can't imagine cape. dressing like this to go fishing. <laughs> right. Yeah, this is like a day trip. Wow. There's a photographer, Maurice Lammy. Oh, oh, really? So oh, the Lammy right. family here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the clothing that they're wearing, which yes. uh, usually the people call costume. Um, even if you didn't know what the date of this was, you could definitely say, oh, this is like the late 1890s, maybe 1905 or so. Based on what they're wearing. Based on what they're wearing. And uh, you got to remember that just because it's 1901 doesn't mean they bought all their clothes that year. Right. So, right. Uh, right. Okay. yeah, that little girl's uh, outfit at the front, I'd say that's more like mid 1890s. Okay. But, uh, yeah, this is a day trip. And, uh, wow. yeah, the hats the men are wearing. 
Got a couple guys there wearing the Montana pink, which is very similar to. And they are in full three piece suits. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With wow. bow ties. I know. There's some bow yeah. ties. There's other formal ties and sure. yeah, it's pretty, fitted jackets. What we would yeah. consider to be pretty formal. Look yeah. at the gentleman in the middle with the starched collar. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that's what always it. amazes me about these camping or fishing photos from this time period is and now what do you what do you think, Michael? Do you think they went dressed like this knowing that a photographer was photographer was coming with them and they were preparing for that? Or do you think this is how they often went out to go fishing I as think a group? This is how trip? they often went out. Although um and I really like they brought their dog, but there are yeah. certainly more informal images as well. Like yeah, okay. like the next yeah, one. the dog in the middle. Yep. There's another <laughs> Galaxy Canyon trip. <laughs> so a considerably there less we go. formal. Let's start lots still of see they're bottles. They're wearing their collars and yeah. ties and everything. They still have the starch collars, but they also have their bottles of whiskey or whatever it is, and their pipes and their. What do you think they're drinking, Michael? Um, I would say you've got at least one beer drinker, and you probably have at least one whiskey drinker. Okay. Now, I haven't compared this, but this is the same photographer in 1901. So this is Maurice Lamy? Yes. In 1901. Wow. So it's interesting. Oh, sorry. Were you going to say something, Ashley? Yeah. yeah. Like, how long do they have to stand like this? Um, by 1901, repeat not very the, long. Repeat the question. So oh, the yeah. question is, uh, how long did they have to stand still for this image? And uh, the answer is probably like maybe a second or two. Okay. By this period, you, you have much faster film. You don't. You're not using wet plate anymore. It's a dry plate. And uh, yeah, you've got a camera. It's got like you know a uh, you know all these settings on it, so you can time this. Um, so yeah, it's like a, it, it's practically like today. So not that long. This is very much a boys' trip. So before, yeah, before you move <laughs> on, the the last trip, the last picture, especially, and this one with this formal dress, like I think of, like I think of Downton Abbey. I yeah. think of them going out on their property or to all do it, and they're the very upper classes. Yeah. And I feel like here we are out in Montana at the turn of the, you know, century, and we're seeing these Americans who are not royalty or lords or anything like that, but are they emulating that idea of sort of being out in nature, all dressed up in this finery, um, which today seems so strange to us because yeah. that's not how we go out and in, into the wilderness or nature or up the canyon, you know? Um, but it's interesting to think of what Americans were thinking about as they chose, you know, that clothing and then to represent themselves that way in a photo. You yeah. know? Well, I would say, no, these are generally Middle class, Middle, guys. right? I know. This is how you would walk around in, in downtown Bozeman. This is what you think you wear. And uh, coming out to the wilderness is nothing new for these guys. I live in Bozeman. It's 1901. They're still, you know, driving around. They're still riding around on their horses. Um, yeah, this is a not. I would say this is a not unusual day trip out of Bozeman. So. People just dressed. They just That's dressed. Just how they do well, it, yeah. you know, if yeah. you go back, like. You know, Jim Bridger didn't dress like that. I mean, you yeah. had your your groups <laughs> that come out that were rough. They were yeah, rough, and right. they were the trailblazers, and they were trading in furs. That had some different classes of people, but that's what I mean. I mean, even when you look at this class, it looks like there's their middle class, but they're sort of still emulating absolutely yeah. what you would yeah. imagine no, upper classes were doing in, no, in back in New York or oh, in in England. Yeah, it's interesting. No, this is exact. You're it just right. looks like a lot of effort for being middle class. <laughs> I'm so happy not to have to do that anymore. <laughs> okay, I got one last Galaxy Canyon okay. one. So okay. this is a different kind of camping where guy's going out hunting so he's out there with his dogs there's a good dog right in the foreground there he's moving all of it and the horses too but yeah this is a classic hunting trip and, and of course for bozeman even today we have a lot of hunters yeah. uh, and then we right. had even more hunters and uh, galton canyon was a place where this type of activity was going on as well yeah and i love the tent you know it looks like a tent he could just pull up really quickly and um you know, probably moved around a lot as he was camping or as he was hunting and kind of camp as he goes. And he's not dressed quite as formally. So definitely not more of so, a, yeah, more of definitely a hunting trip. I, but who took this photo? That's my question. This is a photo by a guy named August Gottschalk. Okay. Who was a, he was a commercial studio photographer 
Ooh. in Bozeman. And this is considerably earlier. This is 1892. Okay. So maybe this gentleman and, and they both went out um, and the photographer just thought, well, I'll take a couple of pictures as we're out here. That's absolutely true. And we have a yeah. number of dot shots. This is, I'm sure this is not the only photo of this trip. So, um, yeah, as I was mentioning before, you might have a photographer that took like 20 photographs of one trip into the forest. Mm -hmm. And um, each one of those has its unique elements to it. But uh, you want, it, you know, as curator, if I'm looking for the thing that I want to put on display, you want the one that tells your story the best. Mm -hmm. So it's great for me because I can look at, oh, here's 20 pictures of this same uh, series of events. This is the one that tells the story. But every one has details, and you know, the more you can zoom in on these, and yeah, uh, you can see there's a lot going on. He's got, uh, you know, it's a great like 1890s saddle on his horse. He's got, uh, you know, his pack saddles as well. Is that, is that tell, what yeah, those are in the front of those? The, yeah, those are pack the saddles. Tent? Okay. So, and, you know, one of those would have gone on that horse, and there's obviously another horse that's not here as well. So, right, right. He's out hunting with his dog. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I see a bottle of. Yeah, liquor that's probably a whiskey <laughs> bottle too, so. yeah yeah all right so we're going to jump into a series on bozeman okay. so these are some of the earliest images wow. of bozeman Bozeman historians will be highly familiar with these yeah but um i thought this was good because i mean we're really familiar with them and you can see a lot of details um, kind of about what's what's happening here. We, uh, this is going to be about 1870, 1871, I believe. And this is a view on Main Street looking east. Wow. So, um, yeah, that, and occasionally we'll see photos in here that show buildings that are still standing. But there are other ways we can look at uh, earlier maps of Bozeman or other types of documentation and say, well, this building was here, this building was here, this building was here. And this is a good way to, to uh, kind of imagine what the, what the look of this was. But you can see the street, it's all dirt, but very Mud. wide. It's just the same. Very wide, today. yeah. Um, but yeah, these are some of the very earliest. So, uh, and this is, a, this is a stereo view. So can you talk about um, stereo views a little bit. Absolutely. There double... are, yeah, we've got a few stereo viewer views here today. And uh, the way this uh, the way this worked is you have a camera that's very much like the wet plate camera that I was showing you before. You pull that lens off and you put a, uh, a camera plate on the front that has two lenses. Okay. That are basically... So be a different front then different to front. this one. And each lens is about the same distance apart as your eyes are. Oh, interesting. So that's so that how that when, works. Yeah. So that when you look at this image through a stereo viewer, it actually looks like it's in 3D. Right. Because it's exactly the same way as your eyes are viewing. So these images, though they look exactly the same, slightly different. Right. So, yeah, that's what stereo views are. And that's why stereo views are great. You can look at that, and it's like you're looking down the street in Bozeman. That's really in fun. Yeah. So I love that you can see the photographer in the photo, the That's shadow right. of the photographer. That's I love his, that. That is his shadow. And then you can tell the time of year because yeah. there's a skiff of snow on the right on the, the street, snow, and you can still. see the and snow. And then even that mountains. long shadow, the time of day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah this is a great photo. This is, and, and, you know, it's very rudimentary, <laughs> you know, Bozeman was founded in 1864. This is 1870. This is right at the beginning. So yeah, it's a great, is, yeah, great 1864 shot. 1864 is like they were putting up their first tents yeah, in town. Yeah. This is six years later. Is yeah. that right? Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and go to the next one here. This is a pretty famous one too. And um, yeah, this is on the balcony of the Metropolitan Hotel. And this is looking west down Main Street. So kind of the opposite direction. Kind of the opposite direction. You see the Cooper block over there, the big uh, brick, block. brick structure yeah. there. And um, that remnants of that building are still there today. Right. right. Um, again, we don't know this photographer, but we suspect that this photo is in 1872. Okay. A really important thing, too, is these wagon trains. There. Yeah. These are freight trains. So everything that comes to Bozeman has to come on those freight trains and they are coming either from Salt Lake 
or front or mid. So, a long uh, way. A yeah. Lot of tracks. Wow. And that's why that street is so wide, is so that they could turn around on that street. And um, there's a barber pole in this photograph, too, if you can see it. And that's the barber shop of one of our residents whose name was Samuel Lewis. And Samuel Lewis was an early resident of Bozeman. And, and he was born in the West Indies and made his way to Bozeman. And his claim to fame is his sister, Edmonia Lewis, oh, who right. was a yeah. famous, world famous sculptress. And she was known throughout the world. And, and he helped support her to a certain degree financially because he was a very good businessman and he did well in Bozeman. And, and she moved to live over in Europe, right? Yeah, yeah. She lived in Rome, Paris and died in London. So, but I love this photo because I love the guy standing there. Yeah. That perspective is so <laughs> great. Yeah, the, way, such a balcony. Yeah. the way he's dressed is perfect for Bozeman yeah. in 1872. He's wow. got the boots, he's got the big hat. Yeah. He's sporting the beard as well. So, yeah, this is, it doesn't get much more Wild West yeah. than this. If we go to the next one, we've got a different view of the Cooper, uh, Cooper building. This is 1874. Um, and again, a lot of these dates, we might have, you know, three copies of it, and they're all different dates. Yeah. So, and you can say, well, maybe this photographer made it, maybe that photographer did. But you can see by the mounts that they're on, they're all this the, Mounts. Yeah. Almost certainly the same photographer. Yeah. They're not marked or anything like that, but we're pretty darn sure that uh, these were happening, you know, within a span of just a couple of years. Were these donated okay. to the museum? These were donations, yeah. And, um, you know, we might get, you know, one or two from one donor and then one or two from the set from somebody else. Oh. So it's, wow. it's a, it can be a real hodgepodge. There's a, a lot of interesting things going on here, too, on the, Left side of the building, you'd see there's a giant boot. Can you, can you zoom side. in? Oh, yeah. Can oh, you, okay, sitting off the building. Can you yeah. zoom in at all? Let's, um, uh, Ashley, or is it hard to zoom in on this? That's okay. We can still see the boot, but the boot's cool. And uh, a couple of other things are happening here. Um, I'm not sure if they have started here yet, but the Speed and Crude Brewery. Mm -hmm. is in this building oh i think it was down just a bit and it might be yeah, yeah. it might be the one that's right next to it um but there was de there were definitely uh saloons here that's the one that has all the people standing in front of it no yeah. question about that <laughs> um but um yeah this building was was really important to the city because it was a huge brick building and again you're only like six or eight years after Bozen was a tenth city. And, yeah, I was going to say, uh, Ashley, we lost it. <laughs> yeah, we lost it. Um, but yeah, it's only a few years after this was a tenth city, and now you've got this huge thing. Bricks made in Bozen. Oh, so, fantastic. Uh, you know, you can see this is a growing concern. Yeah. People are serious about it. They know something is going to come of this. Yeah. So we have gone like through a quarter of the slide so oh, I, I would recommend that we skip yeah ahead. yeah we yeah, better absolutely. yeah oh let's keep going <laughs> <laughs> do we want to skip that one okay oh this is great i love this so I love this. this is the leora hapner house oh, in 1910 nice. and the photo is by leora hapner so i put in a few photos by leora hapner Many people may recognize the name Hapner from Hapner Hall. Yeah, which is at right. Montana State University. It's a here. dormitory, on, and it was originally the women's dormitory specifically. It and, still is. And uh, think, she right? was the head of the education and psychology department between 1932 and 47. And it looks like you can see the the energy yes. smokestack thing there, and then Old Main, the main um thing on Montana's uh, campus yeah. right there. Is is Montana right. Hall is right there with the the sort of steeple. Um, and and there's not much in between. So it's kind of a straight shot from her house yeah. visually. And people yeah. who live in Bozeman uh, might recognize this is taken at 700 South Church Street. Oh, okay. Oh. Today, if you go to this location, you can't see no. anything on the hill at all. They're like houses all Oh, that's so interesting. But I... this is all farm fields here. Okay. 
So yeah, so um, yeah, I wanted that this was a good example of one photographer taking photos of a number of different subjects almost all at the same time. And, and a woman photographer a too, woman which photographer, is which is rare. And we what time that. period again are we talking this about? This is 1910. 1910. She okay. actually marked these photos herself, so we know what they are. So that's always a tip that historians want to give photographers. Label the photos. Yes, so write the date no. on them. <laughs> so, right. But uh, she did some great photography in uh, some other uh, kind of subjects. So if you go to the next one, she's got a whole series that are near immigrant. And, uh, near immigrant Montana? Immigrant okay. Montana. This is in the Paradise Valley. Okay. Uh, yeah, about how far would this be from us? Like 40, maybe, 50 miles? Yeah, like there. maybe 45, 50 miles from Bozeman. But... Um, yeah, so she does, she's got, she's clearly spent uh, a, a certain amount of time, probably just like in one trip, going over there to visit uh, the Paradise Valley. And while she is there, she encounters this, which is a hay crew out there. You know, the Paradise Valley, uh, big for ranching and hay, of course, major part of that. So she took a few photos of it. This is clearly one family, and you've got uh, the, this is a kind of a hay lift is what this is. And uh, the family, here's the uh, daughter and uh, a couple of moms there, while the men are out working, working the field. Yeah. Different view of this. This comes kind of a bigger view. Yeah, wow. Here's the whole yeah. crew. But um Maybe one more. Yeah. But yeah, you can see this is a big this is a big operation. But while she's over there in the Paradise Valley, she stops by the booming young town of immigrants, which is next. Oh yeah. <laughs> Very rustic. And the reason this town's there is because the railroad goes through okay. on the way to Yellowstone. But while she's there, she does some pretty good documentation of different images. So this is on the main street of immigrant. These are, you will notice these are, uh, these are more like touring. Yeah, I was going to say that these are tourists going into Yellowstone. It looks like they are tourists. Yeah. They could very well be exactly that. Yeah. And then the one behind it has all these bags of stuff. That might actually okay. be their, their luggage. Or yeah, they're going into okay. Sure. Yeah. Maybe going into camp. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a Surrey with a fringe on top. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what that's supposed what to be? It is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I think the next one is a duplicate. The go to the one after that. Here's oh, now. gosh, a I little cottage that. hotel. Oh, She's a good that. photographer. She, All her she's images really are beautiful. Good. And yet, these are just snapshots. Yeah, as far great. as we know, this came out the same roll of film. Okay. Oh, wow. And these were in actually the McGill collection. Okay. So it looks like she had one roll of film developed, and this is what was on. First one was wow. her house, and these other ones are her trip. And while she's in the Paradise Valley, of course, you have to go to. Chico Hot Springs. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's an amazing view that of looks Chico. A, a lot yeah, like Chico, does. but a lot very, very much different than the Chico we know today, Chico Hot Springs. Wow. Look it at is. A, she zoomed in a little bit to the next one. Oh, so this look shows at that. you this is what's going on. That is a white touring car there. And okay. uh, about seven years after this photo was made, white touring cars would become. The Yellowstone buses. Okay, so, so they preceded the Yellowstone. Okay. Yeah, Wonderful. to get people in, and you're not that far from Yellowstone. No. You're at Chico. There's a ton of people on that porch that's yes. in the shade. Look at that. Yeah, everybody's kind of lounging so on the porch inside. side. And yeah. it makes sense if you're a tourist on your way to Yellowstone, you might stop off at this hot spring. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, you know, yeah. those of us who have been to Chico, you can just see where that's at. That's right at the entryway yeah. there. Um, we've been there many times. That's wonderful. That's the lodge and then a lodge as well. And 1910, it was probably um, used as medicinal waters for um, people who would go there to, uh, for, for their health as well as for recreation. Yeah. That's neat. Okay. So moving on from okay. here, we yeah. not yet. So, okay. Oh, um, I know we've been talking a little bit about describing what we see. Yeah. and some of the details and another important thing that historians have to do when they are uh, examining photos is look at what's not in not in the okay. So go to the okay. next one. sounds good a classic way to review this is by looking at images of american indians 
Okay. Um, and uh, we've got a number of really good photos in our collection. And this one is uh, a chief, of, uh, a chief of the Blackfeet tribe in about 1890, 1900. And this is uh, Chief Little Dog and his daughter. Um, their outfits are terrific. Very typical uh, Blackfeet. Um, although it's not in color, we can tell by the designs on them that this is very traditional Blackfeet. Okay. Uh, generally, these colors are probably be black and red, probably with a little bit of blue on it. And his daughter behind him is wearing a uh, blouse that's made of dentalia mm, wow. shells. Yeah. Of course, Look at all those. Of course, if those yeah. don't grow, live anywhere around here. That yeah. obviously comes from trade with a West Coast tribe. Beautiful regalia. It's and and then also, are they where are they sitting? Are they sitting in a lodge? They are inside. They are a in a lodge, lodge, also known as you know a teepee, which has you know it's got blankets on the floor, and uh, yeah, that's the that's what the background is here. It's the mm -hmm. canvas from the teepee on the outside, and then they've got a teepee liner that is that thing. That okay, that's beautiful. Yeah. But what I want to point out here is the label on it. It says "Little Dog Chief of the Blackfeet." And uh, this is by a photographer named N.A. Forsyth, who did a huge series of uh, stereo views of American Indians, and he sold these commercially. So unlike a lot of the studio photographers, say, in Bozeman, who would be selling photos just of people in town to give to their families or mm -hmm. send to their friends, um, these photographers, studio photographers, uh, would go out into the field and make series of different uh, photographic subjects, in this case, American Indians, for sale to, you know, nationwide and worldwide. Mm -hmm. So these could be distributed. You might be looking at these in Germany. Germany, I was just going to say. For example, sure. yeah, anywhere yeah. in Europe. Mm -hmm. And another example is the next one, outdoors. So this is at uh, what's called the Choosing Dance. But you can see American flag here, um, very traditional uh you know, dance outfits and regalia. Um, but what you don't see in any foresight images, you almost never see in any photos of American Indians is how difficult and destitute these people were on these reservations. This is about, uh, you know, we're seeing around 1890s or so. There, uh, you know, for the past 30 years or so, Native people have been literally starving to death on these reservations. They are uh, legally banned from leaving the reservation without the permission of the, uh, the government, uh, government agent for that reservation. Times are extremely difficult here. And uh, you never see images of that because these are being made for a particular purpose, right. which so. is to uh, show the outside world this uh, you know, alien world of Native people who are, you know, live, live in the American West. And um, you can see that in a lot of the ways that uh, Native people are represented in portraiture. So the next one, we're showing this is a, this is a photo of uh, John Grass, who was a uh, member of the Oglala Lakota tribe. And uh, during 1876, during the period of the Little Bighorn, uh, he did not join with the other Papas who went and participated in uh, the Little Bighorn battle. He stayed behind. Oh. And because of that, when the Papas were put on the reservation in Standing Rock, mm -hmm. uh, Dakota territory, uh, he they already had a very close relationship with the white people, particularly the agent there. And he was, uh, he was nominated as a judge for that Indian, uh, or Indian law on the, uh, on the reservation. This photo is by, uh, says it's by Scott in Lander, Wyoming. But as a historian of this, I know that, uh, prior to coming to Lander, Scott was headquartered, uh, in North Dakota, okay. in the Dakotas, very close to Standing Rock. Um, and so this was one of the photographers, and there are a few of them, who were basically itinerant photographers. Mm -hmm. They went from uh, military port to military port in particular, 
looking for native people to take photographs of that they could sell. Hmm. Um, and there are a couple of different photographers who did exactly that. D.F. Barry, I got a couple of his photos here. But Orlando Scott Goff is uh, a guy who uh, worked out of Bismarck and later came through a series of uh, Montana ports. He was at uh, Crow Agency, went up to Port Assiniboine, and ended up settled, settling in Haver, where he became a representative, a Montana representative. He took with him, however, all of his glass plate negatives. So he might be in his studio in Haver and be selling photos of Sitting Bull oh, okay. and uh, Rain in the Face and people who he had taken photos back in you know, 1878 at, at his studio in Bismarck. But this guy, we know he was one of those people. So his mark says Lander, Wyoming. And you might think, oh, this is in a studio in Lander. No. Okay. This is not. So um, next one is a different example. You can see here you've got a, oh, well, the last the last photo, you can see that guy was wearing completely Western clothes. They're yes. trying to make him look very dignified. He had his braids, but he had this this very dignified jacket and the collar. He looked like somebody who could be a judge or some official. Exactly. In some sort, yeah. And this is a, uh, this is a photo where I grab a really important guy here in Montana. This is uh, Plenty Coup, um, extremely important leader of the, uh, of the Crow Nation. And his house is still, is now in State, State historic Park. site. His yep. uh, his cabin is still there. Um, this is about 1910, but you can see this is a very different approach to the photography. He's wearing his complete, uh, you know, formal native regalia here, but still uh, showing this great gravitas. He mm -hmm. is a great, important leader, and that is really what uh, what they're trying to to demonstrate. Yeah, that's it, a great photo. That's it. It's a, that's, yeah, and it's a kind of at, towards, you know, when he's older, there's a lot of photos of Plenty Coup out there. And I love this one. I love this photo a lot. Um, it's a great one. It's, it's really yeah. good. And you can tell again by, if you understand uh, kind of uh, crow dress, this is a very like quintessentially crow uh, shirt. We've got crow uh, designs on the shoulders the ermine furs on, in the front. So again, it's a thing where historians can look at this and say, yes, this is very crow. If they didn't know it was plenty coup, they could say, by the dress, I know this is crow or absolaga. Absolutely. Right? And by the, the hairstyle, hair too, yeah. I was going to say, is very distinctive. It's yeah. very crow. It's mm -hmm. Crow are really the only people out here. Who are wearing. But um, the, if you go to the next portrait, this is a completely different right. way of seeing it. This right. is where he's trying, where this photographer, L.A. Huffman out of Fort Kehoe, um, is really trying to uh, show how different these people are than white people. Um, and this guy is, uh, what's his name? This, this, is a guy, this is a guy named Scorch Lightning. And he is actually a Sansark Lakota. Um, who was uh, clearly just in Fort Kehoe. Uh, and usually what happened is these types of photographers would pay Native people to come and sit for them. And then this is a photo that he would be selling in his studio. So the reason that this guy looks the way that he looks, the way he's posed, the way that he's posed, is because this is what appeals to the uh you know, the people who are coming in and want to buy photos of, oh, this is the Old West. This is, uh, these are, this is what I would see if I was in the Old West. You can see upside down there, uh, Huffman is advertising himself as Yellowstone, Yellowstone scenery, scenery and Indian views. Wow. This is his. As, this if, is his as if they're photo. just part of the scenery. Yeah. yeah. It looks a lot, though, posed and aesthetically like an Edward Curtis photograph, which you know, so famous, him going out with those big glass plates and trying to document all these tribes, all these native people, and he would take them and their hair would be beautifully arranged like this. They'd be wearing something beautiful. The lighting would be just so, and a lot of things like this. And so it has that aesthetic appeal where I'm sure there was a market for that, for sure. And the oh, photographer absolutely. looks very similar in his choices. Yeah. It is. And this photo is probably in the uh, 
mid to late 1870s. And Curtis it was... is working probably 20 years after that. I see. Yeah. So this so is before that. that time, I had it backwards. No, no, I didn't no, know no. when it was from. Okay. No, Curtis is working later than that. But this type of photography, yeah. is, he's really playing up this same aspect. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's called pictorialism. And this guy is doing photography before it, pictorialism right. was even a concept. Yeah. And he's already using it here awesome. through the lighting mm -hmm. and his posture and uh, kind of the solo. Well, and where he's having him gaze, the, the right. countenance of his face, just all of that, you know, but still bare skin showing. And it's very interesting. Yeah. It is. Now, look at this one compared to the next one. Mm -hmm. You've got the bare very skin different. again, but yeah. looking very warlike. Yes. And he's looking right at the camera. Directly at the camera. Fiercer look on the face, holding a weapon. Right, and this guy is actually probably an uncle of the guy that we saw before. Interesting. Same oh. photographer, different uh, photographer? Different photographer, mm -hmm. probably made about the same time. Okay. But this, that is a Lakota war club, very serious. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can see how the, the photographer is trying to appeal to different audiences by posing them in different ways. Yeah. When you're the photographer in your studio, you run the universe. Yeah, it's your world. Yeah, these but, studio photos. But they're not all, you know, trying to be extremely formal. In some instances, they're meant to be much more kind of documentary about who this person is. So if you look at the next one, here's a native guy, Crow Indian Hunter. Again, the same, uh, this is L.A. Huffman again. Now, this is, this is clearly in the studio. That's a backdrop behind it. But, uh, this is probably this person's real clothing. Okay. Um, he's holding a sharps rifle, um, and he's dressed up very warmly, so it says Crow Winter Wear. Yeah. But he's, again, it's just this generic, you know, there's no name. It's not as if yeah. this is an individual. Yeah. He's, it's almost like he's a type specimen. He's it's a yeah. type Terrible. specimen, and yeah. that is exactly what a lot of these photographers were doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we get this, um, and it says on the back, who the guy is okay and, but it's not because la hepman wrote that or that was an important thing to him this is exactly right that's a type of specimen but again look at his hair mm, you yeah, know very this distinctive guy's a crow. this yeah. guy is wearing the crow pompadour but it's again it's not always like this you know they're not always a type of specimen if you go to the next one this is hamilton out of bozeman and white sulfur this could be something where these people came in and paid for a photo and wanted a, a portrait right they wanted a portrait yeah and that's a good uh point about uh curtis is that although his uh images were very uh, very commercial mm -hmm. in a way um the families who own copies of those photos now in many cases that's the only photo they have of that person mm -hmm. and they treasure those. yeah yeah, definitely. Um, but there's a lot of controversy, obviously, about Curtis as well. And our next guy kind of tells us why. This is David F. Barry and a friend of his from the Standing Rock Agency. Uh, this is Rain in the Face. He was a very serious Papa warrior, a major part of the Little Bighorn battle. And this is in Barry's studio in Bismarck. And Barry was in Bismarck for a number of years. Um, and uh, Bismarck is located just like just north of Standing Rock, mm -hmm. so he had access to people like Sitting Bull, like Rain in the Face, a number of people who were major parts of the Little Bighorn Bear. Well known, yeah. And well known. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting, one of the interesting things about Barry, one of the interesting things is that his mentor uh, and later his partner was a guy named Orlando Scott Goff. Who I had mentioned before, yeah, yeah. the reason Goff uh, really even got his start in Bismarck at the studio is he came to Bismarck in 1873, which is the same year as Abraham, Fort Abraham Lincoln opened. Okay. And the first group of people there were Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer and the 7th Cavalry. So he was the photographer first actually at the fort and then in Bismarck. So all of the officers went there to have their photos taken. He had those glass plate negatives. And after Little Bighorn, everybody wanted photos of those oh, people. Oh, wow. 
he had the only yeah. photos of a lot of those guys. Oh, gosh. So his photos appeared in New York newspapers, internationally. So he has all these credits all over the place. All these credits all over the place. So Barry came right at the acme of when these Custer photos were really important. And Goff was like, well, now I need to get the photos of the Native people. And Goff is arguably the first person had a, who had a photograph of City Boy. Mm -hmm. Barry kept up that tradition and got the first photos of several other important uh, Papa leaders like Gaul. He has the first photo of Gaul taken like days after his surrender in 1881. So um, Barry was very much involved in this trade as well. Barry, the way Barry described himself as photographer of famous Indians. Um, so the next photo shows us a good example of Barry's work. And this is uh, the war, a, a war chief, again, of the Papa tribe, uh, Good Horse. And he, this is in Barry's studio in Bismarck. And I know this because I'm one of the top historians, I'd be a Barry. But that, uh, that fur piece that he's wearing around his neck and that uh, headdress he's wearing don't belong to him. They belong to D.F. Barry. Okay. So, oh, so was, it's a prop. He was that, kind of putting those on him to dress him up props. for these. That is props. right. And that's probably not yeah. his shirt either. Mm. What's with the stars and all the embellishment? I mean, I, you don't see stars like that so much in the more traditional clothing. This is a no, really interesting getup. Huh. It is an interesting getup. You might have seen a Native person wearing that as part of, part of their outfit, but not anywhere around here, probably. Okay. <laughs> um, but this is a thing where uh, this is something that Curtis was famous for as well. Right, having props. And yeah. that is one of the knocks on Curtis. That's why a lot of Native and a lot of current American Indians say Curtis was terrible. He came in like posed these people and gave them props. Curtis carried around trunks full of different props, uh, depending on what nation he was going to. Mm -hmm. That was part of this tradition. Here. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for Curtis, it was like, he didn't even think twice about that. Mm -hmm. That's what everybody does. And this is a perfect example of Barry starting Starting that tradition. This yeah, tradition. Interesting. So, yeah, he was just kind of, Curtis was then just kind of following what a lot of these forerunners in photography had been doing. Then. Exactly. Yeah, like, so when you're pointing out that Huffman that. image mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. oh, this looks like a Curtis, mm -hmm. Curtis was continuing that tradition and also this tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... How many more do we think we have? We'll just get, do we got a few more Native American ones? And okay. We'll call it okay. All right. Okay. Sounds so, good. And then we do have, uh, go to the next one here. Beautiful photograph. Um, but considerably later, we don't even know who this uh, photographer was. We know this is Chief um, Chief Eagle Feather and uh, his Lakota scent. Again, you've got the uh, studio backdrop. Um but this actually has a, a painted TV as part of the backdrop. And it's He's, been colorized, it it's looks been like, too. Colorized. It's yeah. hand color. Okay. So, yeah, I think, uh, but not all images, obviously, are portraiture. If you go to the next one, you can see these are a Crow agency about 1888. It's photographer's W.R. Cross. And again, it's posed, but it's definitely, you know, it's outside it's this in situ. It's, it's got yeah. the kids out. Uh, you've got the wagon out. You actually have uh, that brush arbor behind uh -huh. him there and the, the TV encampment. This is exactly what you see at Crow Fair right. today. And yeah, obviously a lot of photography going on at Crow Fair. It's the exact same idea. And you can see this is, in fact, the clothing that those uh, Crow cowboys would be wearing. They, mm -hmm. They're dressed like cowboys. There's a, I got another one here. And um, this is from a completely different reservation, but same idea. This is a Shoshone uh, family and kids in front of their in front of their TV. This is about 1915. So would they be selling these photographs as well, or are these more just okay? All right. Yeah, these they would yeah. be selling these, okay. and this is probably a Lander Wyoming photographer. But you can I know because I'm familiar with this reservation. This is on the Wind River Reservation in Central Wyoming. Um, and you can see by the dome top of that, you know, this is one image 
Hysteria. Hysteria. Oh, and okay. so would they have left um, or provided a, a copy for the family or would they have just taken these images, maybe paid them something for it and then left? They would almost certainly have just paid them for them okay. and left. In order to view this, you actually have to have a stereo viewer and it's unlikely that Native people would, would have one of those. They could probably just buy one. And I'm sure if they did have one, he would give it one. But the other thing to remember is He's not uh, developing these on right site. there, so there's he no. He takes them back, right, yeah, so there's okay. yeah. It's not even printed while he's here. Yeah. Most likely, he paid this family to do these photos, mm -hmm. and then he went back to his studio and made us a series of you know, okay. there's fifty images of native people on on the reservation. Right. But again, great image. This family is not identified, but it's surprisingly often that. Uh, American Indian people can come and look at this collection. Someone people are will unidentified and they recognize it. They'll yes. say, oh, I've got a copy of this. Yeah. This is my family. Yeah. And for a family to have an image like this, it's priceless. And um, it's the same thing for any family. Right. Of course, to, right. Like to find but to it, be able to have it's that. It's so much more yeah. rare for these people who are desperately uh, poor to have, have something like that of this extreme extremely difficult period for for native people. Maybe one more. This is a hand colored image again, crow, um, but beautifully hand colored. Um, and again, this is a this is a uh, an image not even named. We don't know who the photographer is, but somebody went to the uh, trouble of hand uh, tinting this. Clearly, one yeah. for clearly went for commercial sale. Um, it's a beautiful image. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. So that's a good one. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times when you're looking at a large collection like we have at the Museum of the Rockies, you're going to go a little bit beyond uh, this, you know, you're out, you know, what's on that horse or uh, how many spittoons are here. Yeah. Sometimes you'll run across something in a collection and it just jumps out at you as just being a spectacularly beautiful photo. Oh, look at that. Wow. So wow. this is an That's Egypt beautiful. rice photo uh, around mid to late 1880s and at a oh. deer lodge. But it's a spectacular photo. Um, really unusual. That's very, uh, very unusual. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It is, it's kind of haunted. It is a little bit. So describe yeah. it for the listeners. Yeah. 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 So, so this is a photo of a woman looking in a mirror at herself. And the photograph is taken from her from the back of her. So you see her hair and then you see her face. It's like, you know, now we do these all the time, or young, younger people than me do these all the time, you know, these kind like, of like the the selfies, selfie photo. Yeah, in the mirror. I know, but here it's, and, but she's looking directly into the camera yeah. through the mirror. So you see this beautiful gaze, but you're seeing the back of her very long, beautiful hair, the way it's styled in the front, her dress, and the way it's framed in the mirror is just beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Great, beautiful light. Wonderful. It's lovely. Yeah. We, have a, we yeah. have a huge collection of this photographer's work, studio photographer. It's the only one even remotely similar to that. I wonder huh. what made him take this photo. We will never oh, know. And wow, that's, that's, that's kind wonderful. of one of the beauties yeah. about yeah. having a big collection like this. He'll be running through lots and lots and lots of photos and he'll run across something like that that's like completely out of the mm. uh, yeah. And that's a photo that's kind of, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's lost in our collection, but there's so many images. Right, yeah. But that, I mean, it's such a gem. Yeah, that's a beautiful photo to end on. That's yes, wonderful. That's that wonderful. is, that's a great one to end on. Yeah. If you have any other questions, I know we've oh. probably gone a little bit long here. But... No, that was wonderful. That was great. I think it just gave us such an amazing yeah. overview, <laughs> really, of the gems that are in there, but also um, what you can do and what you can learn. It just makes it more inviting to kind of delve into that that online page on the website where you can access the archive. I yeah, think that's fantastic. So we encourage to go and look at the online website, the what the Museum of the Rockies website, their online photograph collection, and just look around, just browse around and you'll see lots of other photos that we didn't look at today. But these photos were spectacular. Thank you. Thanks so much. Michael, Michael for that was huge. Pulling yeah, these fantastic. together. So that was yeah. great. Absolutely. Always a pleasure to work with you folks. Yeah. And um yeah, come check us out at Museum of the Rockies online at museumoftherockies.org. 
And if you have any questions about photos or anything else here, you can always contact me directly uh, right here at BC to the Rockies. So thank you. Thanks. And thanks, Michael, so much. And thanks to all our listeners out there and potentially our viewers. Um, if you love this podcast, please tell a friend and please like it, subscribe so it shows up in your feed whenever we have a new one, which is usually every other week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. So thanks so much for being with us today. We hope you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on the past. past. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Thanks so thanks, much. Guys. And if you are watching this on YouTube, if you could just press the like button on that too, or the thumbs up button. And that would be wonderful. So a big thank you again to the Museum of the Rockies for the use of this beautiful studio space. Thank you to Ashley. Ashley Fox. had a lot yeah. of work today. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. And uh, thank you to Michael Fox and Melissa Don and Chelsea Hogan for all their work in helping us bring this great information and this beautiful photograph collection to you today. So thanks everyone.